Hello. We are back here for Sunday morning, and we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, the first 11 verses this morning. Now, last Sunday, it was I introduced you to the church in Philippi, how it got started as Paul went into Philippi and met Lydia and the jailer, and they're part of the core group of the starting of that church, and we, of course, saw that in the book of Acts. But I also gave you something to do uh, last Sunday, and I just want to see if you've done it. Uh, did you write down anything that was causing you to not be happy, to not rejoice? Second was, take that list and give it to God. Read it out loud to Him. You don't have to shout it, but just say it out loud to God. Third was, ask God to take that entire list and replace it with a joyful list, a list that, uh, of joy, and the first thing on that list was, should be, Jesus died for you. And the last was, if you didn't think you could do that, you couldn't write that list, you couldn't ask him to replace it, then read the book of Philippians all the way through, four simple chapters, and then come back and meet us here. Well, we're back. I thank you for coming back and joining us. And we're going to see today how Paul begins talking about how he Praise, praise for the church there in Philippi. And so I want to ask you, how important is prayer to you? How important is prayer to you? Are you the type of person, you pray without ceasing? Or do you pray daily? Do you pray for the lost? Do you pray for your family? Or are you the type of person that it's your last resort, and so you figure you better take and pray? I was told a long time ago that if you've got a person in your life, maybe it's your boss, could be your spouse, a child, parent, maybe it's a neighbor or a co-worker, if you just don't get along with, rather than argue with them, rather than have to avoid them, pray for them. Pray and lifting them up to God and allow God to make the change in them because that's how powerful prayer is. So, if you pray for all kinds of people, let me ask you this. Do you pray for your church? Do you pray for Heinz Chapel? And as you pray, what is it you want to see your church do? Do you want to see your church reach uh, the unchurch? Do you want to see us grow? Uh, do you want to see uh, new ministries start, old ministries start? Are you asking God, praying about that? Do you want to see your church become an influencer in the community, in the county, even in the state? And what is it is specifically you'd like to see your church do or become? Tell it to God. Pray about it and lift it up to Him. I've read some churches, uh, or read about some churches where they had nobody praying. Their attendance was on the decline, and still nobody prayed. And guess what happened to those churches? They either died out or they split. Then I've read about churches that had at least one person praying. They also were on the decline. And the person was praying for a revival to break out in that church. And sooner or later, God brought a, a pastor or a leader in that just God used and kaboom that church had revival break out, and it grew and it grew, not just numerically, but it grew spiritually, and it became a strong church in its community and state, because that's how powerful prayer is. Prayer can and does make a difference. Think about Elijah. He prayed no rain for three plus years, no rain. Then he prays again, God send rain. And a cloud the size of a human hand brought an abundance of rain. Jesus made a habit of praying all the time. And then there is the Apostle Paul who made prayer a habit as well, praying for churches, praying for individuals, praying for himself, praying for his circumstances. Our current circumstances have not been what any of us have wanted, and we should be praying about those circumstances. 
Now, we've been, of course, isolated, unable to be together as a church. You can't, families cannot even get together. Some of you have lost your jobs or you've been furloughed from your jobs. You're starting to worry about how am I going to put food on the table, keep the electric on. Depression could be even setting in. But prayer is something we can all do and is what can and will make a difference in all of our lives and in the life of our church. Plus, prayer is what will give you joy. It will lead you to rejoice in your life. Now, as I said last week, I shared how Paul was led to Philippi. Well, when he writes to this church that uh, Lydia and her household and the jailer and his household were some of the founding members. Paul's in Rome. Now, he's not in jail, but he's under house arrest. What does that mean? Well, remember when he was in Philippi, he was inside the jail in chains. Well, now he is in a rented home that he has to pay for. People can come to him, minister him, talk with him, bring him food, do all kinds of things, but he can't leave because he's chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And he writes under that condition to this church, and he's saying, I rejoice because of you. So today we're going to seek to discover what it is Paul prays, because that's how he starts this letter off, saying, I'm praying for you and I'm rejoicing because of you. So how does Paul pray and uh to answer the question of how we praise will help us understand how we can and should be praying for Heinz Chapel, our church. In the message, I titled Praying with Joy. So, let's begin Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, the first two verses. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, it's really Paul and Timothy that are writing this letter. Now, when we write a letter, of course, uh, we don't start off saying, you know, from Calvin to whoever. We, we might sign it, we sign it at the end, but we'd also take that letter, put it in an envelope, and mail it with our return address so that person who receives it says, oh, Calvin sent me a letter. Or if you do an email, which is more common today, the email says from it's who it's from, and you know maybe a, put a something in the subject line, and it comes in that person's email box. Well, in Paul's day, in this day, the first century in the Roman Empire, their letters were scrolls, rolled up, nowhere on the outside to put a return address, so they started their letters this way. Here's who it's from, here's who's to. So Paul and Timothy write this. They're servants, and it's your translation. I'm, I'm using the Christian Standard Translation, by the way. Uh, might say bond servant or bond slave. The Greek word is doulos. A doulos is not somebody who was bought as a slave or traded for as a slave. Not even like an indentured slave or indentured servant where they're working off something for someone. A doulos is somebody who was a free person. And they say, I am willingly going to follow you. You're going to be my master. Now, Paul and Timothy say they're servants, bond servants of Christ Jesus. You see, that's the way we're supposed to be. Bond servants of Christ Jesus. Not of, of me, not of the church, but of Christ Jesus. We're his servants. Now, he's writing, it says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. So he's writing to all believers. Because when you read saints in the Scripture, it's talking about a believer. Don't think about like how the, the Christ, uh, Catholic Church puts it, of a saint. You know, there's somebody who's done some miraculous thing, and they're elevated up above every other person. No. Saint, and a saint's not a perfect person. A saint is a believer, and we all know believers are not perfect. And so, to all believers in Christ Jesus, in Philippi, the church in Philippi, and he says, including overseers and deacons. So in other words, he's not just 
right into the leadership. Overseers would be a modern-day pastor then. He's not just writing to the leaders. He's writing to everybody, including the leader. And he says, grace and peace, which is typical greeting that you'll see that Paul uses in just about all of his letters. You know, it's from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Not just from him, but grace and peace. And you think about grace. Grace is God's free gift to you and me. You see, God loved us so much, sent his only son. He didn't have to. But by grace, we're saved. The word grace can also be translated as kindness. So God, out of the kindness of God, sent his son so we could be saved by grace. Peace is that peace that surpasses all understanding. You could be going through the worst time of your life, and maybe you are right now, but you can have a peace. Because you know God, you know Christ, you're walking with him, you know he's with you right now, and you just have a sense of peace about you no matter what. Paul is going to say in the next section that he's praying. He's praying to this church, not just to a certain group, but to everybody in it. And I wanted to share what John writes in 1 John uh, 4 or excuse me, 5, 14, and 15. John says this. He says, this is the confidence we have before him, before God, Christ. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Now let's clarify this. John is not saying you can just ask God for whatever you want and you're going to get it. You can say, God, I need a brand new Mercedes Benz, Lexus, whatever type of car you want. It doesn't mean you're going to get it. Because if you do that, then you're treating God like some genie. Instead, you go to God and say, God, here is what I want. But John clarifies it by saying you ask according to God's will. Oh, well, how do I know the will of God? Read God's Word. It's all there. Talk to Him. He'll tell you. Walk with Him. In our study with Nehemiah, he prayed for four months, and God used that time to mold him so that God could open the door for Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem and oversee the rebuilding of the wall. Nehemiah knew what God's Word was, and he prayed it back many times to God, saying, God, you said this. And so we can have confidence in whatever we ask of God because we're praying according to God's will. For example, God's will is every human be saved. That every human being, by God's grace, will come to have a relationship with, Christ, with God through Jesus Christ. Who do you have in your life that you should be praying for? Because you can be praying for their salvation, for their however it might come about, and you can be confident that God will do it because that is a part of God's will. We might not have confidence in that the person we're praying for is going to listen, but we can have confidence that God will work in their lives and lead them to salvation. So what, and I didn't give you my heading, but it's pray for the church membership. Pray for the church membership. Whatever's going on in their life, God wants good for all of us, not bad, not evil. God wants to watch over us and provide for us, and he's always with us. So pray for the church membership. That's the first thing that we should be doing. The second thing is pray with joy for the church. Pray with joy for the church, verses 3 through 6. Paul says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on into completion until the day of Christ. So Paul says, here, I'm praying for you, but I'm praying with joy because in all of my prayers for you. I thank God of, of just giving me thoughts 
remembrances of the time that I was with you. But what gives him joy is of the partnership in the gospel. He says from the first day, he goes down to the river, finds a group of ladies that are praying, and Lydia, God opened her heart because she heard the gospel message from, G, uh, from Paul and accepted Christ. The jailer had heard Paul and Silas praising God, singing hymns, earthquake happens. He thinks everybody's escaped. He's ready to take his own life. Paul says, we're all here. And what's he do? He asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? That's the first day, the first part of how that church got started until now. Here's Paul in Rome under house arrest. But you see, in between that first day and that point when he wrote this letter, the Philippian church, of all the churches, not the richest church that, that Paul helped start, but they're the ones that would often take up collections and send to support his ministry. Evidently, they've sent money there to Rome to help take care of him. He's having to pay his own rent for where he's living. He's having to buy his own food. So they're still supporting his ministry. They're still participating in the gospel. You say, well, how's Paul being arrested participating in the gospel? Uh, we'll see that in the coming Sundays. But Paul says, I'm sure of this one thing, that you, what was started in you, the good work started in you, will be carried on to its completion. That, uh, and it will happen all the way up until the day of Christ. Now, Paul's not saying he started that work. It's just like with Lydia, when she heard the message of Christ, God opened her heart. For me, you know, I, I've said, I went forward, pleased my parents, safety, because I had a number of friends going forward at the same time, but it was sitting in the back seat of my parents' car. I didn't have the thought. God reminded me, I said, I'd ask God, isn't there a better way? You see, God opened my mind and my heart. The same should be true for all of you. You don't just wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to get saved today. God is working in your life, or worked in your life, calling you to him. God starts the good work in each and every one of us. And God will see it through until we stand before Jesus. Uh, it says the end of verse 7, until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, what's that day? Well, that day is going to be either when we die and go to heaven, or the rapture takes place when we all believers go to heaven, and we will be standing in what's known as the Bema Seat of Christ. That's for believers only. And there, you're going to be standing... God's going to be the judge, and Jesus is going to be our advocate, our lawyer. And there's Satan making all kinds of accusations. Satan's going to stand up and say, God, let me tell you all the evil that Calvin did in his lifetime. But Jesus is going to say, wait a minute, Dad, judge, I died for his sins. I paid his sin debt. And he'll look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see, that's when it's completed. It's not that I work for that completion. It's not that I can do anything to complete or fulfill the work that I can do for God. God works it in me until that day right there. Now, he says from the participation or partnership in the gospel from the first day, that's how most churches start, a participating or partnership in the gospel. It's not a partnering with another church to start a, a church. It's not a partnering with a, a social uh, uh, group to start a church. You partner in the gospel message of Christ because that's what saves us. That's what saves individuals. That's what allows us into heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. That's the gospel message. Jesus is that gospel message. And most churches begin that way, and that's how the Philippian church did. Paul shared it with Lydia. Paul and Silas shared it with the jailer and their household. And the church began then by being proclaimed. 
Now, I've said for a long time, a church can do all kinds of things to reach its community, to reach its state and beyond. You can do all kinds of mission trips. You can do all kinds of mission projects. But if you don't share the gospel, you're not being a church. You're being a social club. You think about it. Church, you could take and hold an event to reach your community every month, every week as far as that goes. But if you're not telling people Jesus died for them to pay their sin debt, to allow them into heaven, you're just social club. There's plenty of social clubs in this world. We need more churches that proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So, pray for church members and pray with joy for your church. I, I'm sure, you know, it, it, don't get hung up on saying, oh, that church, if they had just done this. Have joy in your heart. Don't look for the negatives. It's to be about Jesus, not the people in the church. The third thing is, pray with love or excuse me, pray that love flourishes in the church. Pray that love flourishes in the church. Verse number 7, Paul says, Indeed, it was right for me to think this way about you, because I have you in my heart, and all are partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of my confirmation of the gospel. Now, Paul was there in Philippi. He got arrested. He got imprisoned. He got to defend himself because they did eventually release him. And guess who was there with him the entire time? Now, they may not have been right beside him, but they supported him, the Philippian church. And so he knows this. And now he's essentially in prison, and they've been supporting him, still supporting him. He knows this. They are together. That's why he has them in his heart. They are partners in grace. Verse 8 says, For God is my witness, how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I just want to stop and talk a sec here about affection of Christ Jesus. You know, you can have love your, your family. You can love your church family. But do you love them with the affection of Christ Jesus? What kind of affection is that? What kind of love is that? It's an agape love. It's an unselfish love. It's not a, I love you if you do this for me. It's not a, well, I, we're going to trade off, you know, and make it an even Stephen type of love. It's, I'm just going to do for you because Jesus did for me love. And you think about that for me. You know, read that verse where God uh, says to he says, I miss all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. That's a different type of love or affection. And Paul is leveling up, you might say, and that we should have in us as well. He says in verse 9, I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may prove the things which are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, the day of judgment. So he says, I'm praying that love grows in you, that it will flourish in you. But with that growing love, that their knowledge will grow, knowledge of God, of Christ, of their faith, and that they'll be able to have every kind of discernment because, well, there are people out there that don't preach the gospel. They preach similar. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia about how people were coming along with a different gospel. Not the same one he preached. It, it was similar, but it wasn't the same. Same thing still going on today. You, you can turn on and watch Countless preachers on just about any day if you've got the right channels. Some of them are right on. They're going to preach God's Word. Some of them, not so much. They may read a scripture verse. They may not even read a scripture verse. And those are the ones you've got to stay away from. They read the scripture verse, but then they just go off on their own little tangent. Instead of saying, 
Here, here's what it says in following God's word, telling you what God has to say. They tell you what they want you to hear. Paul is saying, I want your love to grow, that you can discern things like that, so that you may approve things that are superior and that you would be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Oh, oh you, you might be thinking, there's no way I could be pure and blameless. I, I've done too much wrong in my life. Well, remember he started off writing to the saints. Now, a saint is not a perfect person, but it is a believer. But in God's eyes, because of Christ, because you've placed your faith in Christ, you are seen by God as pure and blameless. Couldn't be, you couldn't enter into heaven if God saw you any other way because either you're pure and blameless or you're a sinner. And so this is what Paul is praying about for that church, that they will grow in love, grow in knowledge, grow in discernment, and that they will be seen pure and blameless until the day of Christ. There's two places that all humans are going to go or go to one or the other on the day of Christ, the day of judgment. As I said, the beam of seed of Christ is where all believers go. The great white throne of judgment is where non-believers go. Now there, as I said, at the beam of seed, Jesus is going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter to the kingdom of heaven. At the great white throne of judgment, there will be people who attended church. Who, who did things. There will be pastors and deacons and Sunday school teachers there. And, and they're going to say, uh, Jesus, why am I in this line? I'm supposed to be in the other line. And, and they're going to say, you know, Jesus, I, I taught Sunday school for you. I, I went on mission trips for you. I, I stood up and defended you, and I prayed in your name. And Jesus is going to say, never knew you. We never had a relationship. What you did was for you, not for me. You see, there is a fine line, and it's another reason to be praying for your church. He closes that up in verse 11. He says, filled with the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You see, that's what it's about. That we'd be filled with what God says is right, righteousness, not for our glory, not for the church's glory, but for the glory and praise of God of God Almighty through Jesus Christ. Because the only way we can come to Jesus Christ, or come, excuse me, to the Father, is through Jesus Christ. So we need to pray. Love will grow. Love will flourish in our church. Do you know what will happen to a church that loses its love? There's an example in Scripture. Revelation chapter 2. Chapters 2 and 3 uh, is where John writes what Jesus tells him to, to the seven churches. The first church that John writes to, that Jesus tells him to write to, is Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is where Paul spent his third missionary trip, spent about three years there. In fact, Ephesus uh, had people come to Paul because he was teaching every single day there, and people came to him, learned from him, got saved under his teaching, and they go back to other cities and start churches. Colossae is one of them. Paul never set foot in Colossae. He writes to that church, but it's people that got saved under his teaching in Ephesus that go back to Colossae and probably other churches as well started in the same way. And they were a great church there in Ephesus. They were a strong church. A, a church, as I said, that started other churches. But here's what Jesus has John write to this church. Revelation 2, 4 and 5. He says, but I, Jesus, have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. You've forgotten your first love. Remember then how far you've fallen. Repent. Do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Twice he tells them they need to repent. 
the lampstand reference, if you go back into chapter 1, he says the lampstands represent the church, or church is, these seven. The problem is they forgot their first love. Well, what should be every church's first love, every Christian's first love? Jesus, the one who died for you, the one that gives us our joy or should be the reason for our joy, number one. He says, you've forgotten it. What does that mean? Well, it means they've gone from being a church to being a social club. They're doing things, but they're not sharing the gospel message. That They've got the building, they've got the people, they've got the position. But it's no longer about Jesus. It's about something or someone else. He says, you've fallen. They used to be on a great level with Christ, and they've fallen from that. Repent. Repent essentially means change direction. You're going in the direction that you think is right. Now you've got to stop and turn around and go in the direction that God says is right. You've got to agree with God. That's what repent means. Don't agree with self. Agree with God. Otherwise, it says he'll remove the lampstand. Now here's how I, I interpret this for today. There are churches that forget their first love. They're no longer about the gospel of Christ. They're about something or someone else. And Jesus is going to send people, send things in there to say, you've got to repent or else. It's not a matter of removing the lampstand. It's a matter of I'm going to remove my Holy Spirit. I'm going to allow you to do whatever you want to do, but I'm not going to be present. And I believe this is what Jesus is telling the church in Ephesus, that if you don't repent, I'm not going to be with you. The Holy Spirit will not be with you. You're on your own. Oh, that is a fate worse than death. Paul told the church in Rome what we must do in order to not lose our first love. Romans 12, 2, he says this, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Those words that Paul writes apply to us today, this age. Do not be conformed to this age. So church, and the church is not the building, it's you that's watching this. Don't be conformed. Don't fit into the mold of the world. Now, the world will tell you a whole lot is okay to do. But God's Word is going to say, no, it's not. He says, don't fit into that mold. Instead, be transformed. In other words, change how you think. Renew your mind. Well, how should you be thinking? That's easy. Have a biblical worldview. You have to read the Bible. You don't have to have it all memorized, but you've got to know what it's about, who it's about, who the enemy is, who the hero is, so that you look at the world through God's biblical worldview or God's eyes, you might say. And then you'll be able to discern what God says is good, what God says is pleasing, what God's perfect will is, because you're in here and you're thinking God's way not man's way. All right, I started off saying, as we learn how Paul prayed, we'll learn how we should, what and how we should pray. So, how should you pray? What should you pray? Well, you can pray for world peace, pray for missionaries all around the world. You can pray for your friends and relatives, people that you work with, co-workers. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for all of them. You can pray for government leaders, and we definitely need to be praying for the leaders of our government as the decisions that need to be made. And, of course, I say for all the quarreling that our federal government does, we need to be praying for them. We can pray for the sick. We can pray for the hurting, pray for the elderly. But most importantly, pray for your church. The church is what changed the world for Christ. You know, 12 uh, apostles changed the world. For Christ. They started the church. They kept the church going. They spread the church. And the church today has the responsibility to share the gospel message in our world today. 
to pray for your church, do not pray some generalized prayer. Oh, Lord God, I just want to lift up my church and ask that you take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen. No, don't, don't, don't pray something real general like that. And, and don't pray just going down the prayer list. Well, let's see, there's Billy Bob and Mary Lou and, and, and there, there's, there's Timmy and, and Tommy. And, you know, and just go down saying a list of names or just reading it. Don't do that. Go down and say, oh, I know this is what's going on, and God, you know, they're fighting cancer, or they're going in the hospital, or they just had surgery, and Lord, I ask for you to heal. I ask, be more specific is the point I'm trying to take and make. So when you pray, according to what Paul did, pray naming the saints of your church. Name us. List everyone. Get a directory. Write down a list. Pray, naming the saints of your church. Saints are believers. Two, pray with joy in your heart for your church. If you don't have joy in your heart for your church because somebody did something you didn't like or said something you didn't like or they didn't say it or they didn't do it, then you've got other issues. Maybe we need to talk. But this is your church. You need to have joy in your church because, well, you know, this is what my church has done. And this is what my church can do. And we need to be unified in that sense and pray with joy for your church. And third is pray that the love will flourish, that it will grow in your church. Imagine what our church can be like if our congregation prays that way, praying for each other praying with joy in our heart for the church, praying that love grows. You know what we'd be? We'd be a church on fire for Jesus Christ. There'd be no stopping what God could do through us if we pray this way. Now, for our church to be on fire for Christ, I've got a list of six goals I'd like you to complete. Now, you're not going to complete them necessarily at one setting or in one week, but write down this list, and you can pause this. It's on video. Go back and write. You can contact me, and I'll send you this list of six goals. But as we, the more of us complete the six goals, the more on fire we will be. Now you say, well, we're not together. <laughs> well, we'll be a bunch of burning numbers spread around, and just imagine what it's going to be like when we can come together. We will be a roaring fire. The six goals. First off, set aside a specific time and place to pray daily. Don't just say, well, I pray. Pray daily at a specific time and a specific place. It might be you have a prayer clock. Maybe you're sitting at your dining room table. Maybe it's going to be 10, 11 o'clock at night on the side of your bed. But have a specific time and place to pray. Second, daily read God's Word and allow God to speak and to fill you with joy for your church. You've got to read God's Word. I heard David Jeremiah say a long time ago, says, you can pray a proverb a day. Just pray where the date is. If it's the first day of the month, you, you read Proverbs 1. If it's the 15th day, you read Proverbs 15. If it's the 31st day, you read Proverbs 31. And just repeat. You, you can all do that. You say, oh, I, can't, I don't have time for all that. Well, Get you a devotional. Every devotional I've ever looked at has at least a portion of Scripture. And then read that. You're getting a little bit of God's Word and take and read the devotional. Read a chapter a day. Read for five minutes, 15 minutes. Just read God's Word daily. But as you read it, don't just try and hurry up and read. Let God speak and let God fill you with His joy. Third, at least once a week, pray for each saint of a church. Pray for whatever know, whatever need you know they have. So you can do it every day, but I'm asking you to pray at least once, one day a week, or maybe you'll split it out. You've got 50 names, you could pray 10 over five days. But pray for every saint in your church at least once a week. Fourth, thank God for all the gospel sharing our church has done, does, and can do but leave the negatives alone. Oh, if, if they had only shared the gospel with my cousin when I brought them, leave the negatives alone. 
By doing that, you're giving Satan a toehold. And he will pull you down, and he'll pull others down with you. Be thankful and thank God for what your church has done. Fifth, ask God to grow our church with and by his love, agape love. And six, trust God to make the needed changes. Don't trust me. Don't trust yourself. You have to trust God to make the needed changes. Now, in John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus gives a commandment for all of us. He says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciple if you love one another. What's Jesus saying? Love everybody because he loved us. That's the condensed version. And by doing that, the unchurched, family members, neighbors, relatives will see your Christ disciple by how we, the church, treats one another because we are loving others the way Christ loved us. So, remember our joy and our love for the church. It's not due to what you can do or have done or what anybody might do. Our joy, our love for the church is due to what Christ has done for each and every one of us. You and I just have to believe that he's done it. He came, he died, and he raised from that grave to forgive us of our sins. Real quickly, I want to read the first line. I'm not going to sing it because I'll scare everybody. Of take time to be holy. It's in our hymn book. The first line says, Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Pray a lot. Pray regularly. Pray daily. Abide with him always. Abide can also be translated in Scripture as remain. So remain in him always. Feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. See, that's why we need to pray for all the saints of our church on a regular basis. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessings to seek. Be positive. And this is praying with joy for our church. And God will use it for all of our benefits. No, he'll use it for his benefit because that's what it's all about. Let me close in a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you for Paul, for his letter to the church in Rome. We thank you, O Father, that we can pray with joy, that we can have joy, and we thank you, Father, that you started a work in us, and you're going to complete it. No one else, just you, God. And so, Father, may each one who hears this message, who looks at this scripture, may you start to fill them with joy. May they seek to fulfill those six goals that I presented. And may you make us a church on fire for Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen.